reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Gary, I was reading in a recent article of yours in Business Week that you thought the transition from the existing system to a market system in Eastern Europe should be made rapidly, that there should be, as it were, shock treatment. I don't know whether I've got you exactly right or not, but uh, I don't feel in, in agreement with that at all. No. For one reason, I don't think it can be done. An attempt to do what is impossible lo usually leads to bad results. Well, it's of course, we both agree the events going on in Eastern Europe is probably the most important sort of laboratory for an economist that we have seen in a long time. Of course, and it has a great deal of impact on the people, naturally. I do believe it should be important. I mean, you, you got my um, message uh, absolutely correctly. In fact, I believe it should be as rapidly as it's possible. Let me uh, maybe explain for a few minutes why I believe that, and then we can. <laughs> you can tell me why you think that it's all full of holes. Uh, I think there are several reasons that go into my argument. One, I suspect we will agree on, is that we really don't know how to sequence what the changes should be. There, there is a discussion in the literature of people who write about this subject that first we should do macroeconomic stability and then we should do this and then we should do that. And I think they're just whistling in the wind, so to speak. We don't know. Maybe there is an optimal sequence, but I don't think economics is that far advanced that we know the sequence. So that would be my first point. Secondly, the, what's going on, I think, in any country when you experience a rapid change is you have a window of opportunity to make major changes before the political forces arise who have a vested interest in the old system and they get powerful again. It's clear that in Eastern Europe the communists and people who had depended upon the communist system were thrown on the defensive as a result of the basically revolutions that went on in these nations. And that, yet they're going to get power and they are getting power. We see that in, in the countries that are going slow like in Romania, in Bulgaria, some, even in Poland, which went rapidly in some respects, in, in Russia and some of the other Russian republics where they've been frozen, it's been very difficult to do anything. So if you move quickly, you have a chance to make changes that are irreversible before the political forces can um, organize. And my third force that I believe is important is that we want to move to a market system. And I believe even if we get components of a market system in place, that's better than waiting in trying to orchestrate and organize efficiently how we're going to get more and more components. So let me give you some examples of that. Poland very quickly went to liberalizing prices and its exchange rates. And I think that was great for Poland. That gave them a system of relevant measures, of relative worth, and, and that has worked very well for them. On the other hand, Poland has been very slow in privatizing. And because of that, they're finding it increasingly difficult to privatize. So they still have something like 50 or more percent of their large enterprises in state hands. If we contrast that with Czechoslovakia, which is now split into the Czech Republic and Slovakia, if you look at the Czech Republic, they started later than Poland. The revolution came a bit later. They also went rather quickly in liberalizing prices. What they did do, that Poland didn't do, is they organized what outsiders would say would be a very disorgan a disorganized privatization system where they gave people vouchers and let them free to bid on, on these vouchers. In this way, in three years, they privatized pretty much their whole public sector, which was almost 100% of the, their economy. And, and they're functioning well, low unemployment and the like. So I would say to summarize three reasons. 
One, we don't know what to do. Two, we want to move quickly before the political forces are organized. And three, even parts of a market system are better than none at all. The strange thing is that I agree with everything you say. I just come to a different conclusion. Of course you can't, you don't know what the sequencing should be. You can't plan a transition any more than you can plan an, e an economy. All that is true. It's also true that the political system can operate in a way that will frustrate the move. All that is true. In some countries, things work more easily than others. I agree with that. But now let's see why you can't really move to a market economy, even if you want to. The difficulty with, with communism is that, that it's, a t it's a terrible thing that's been done, but it's very difficult to reverse. And the reason is that to work a market economy, you don't only need to allow people freedom. You don't only allow them to, to, to set prices. You have to have the institutions that make a market possible. And these institutions are very difficult to establish. It took us hundreds of years to, to, to do it. Some countries can operate better because they're not all that far away from a market economy. It's not only that you don't have the institutions, you don't have the people who, who understand how to work a market economy. In, in, in Russia you get rid of a collective farm and what do you get? You get a lot of unemployed workers who are used to taking orders and a lot of bureaucrats who are used to creating rules and enforcing them. You don't have anyone there who, who's, who's able to, to work a, a market economy. And I just don't see how you can move quickly now, you, you see, if you take your first point, not working from above, I, I, I agree with that, absolutely. But actually, in the breakdown that's occurring, you're going to get a lot of local operations at, at work. And it's there that you're going to get the, the change. It'll build on the existing institutions. It won't be what we would expect. We don't know. We shouldn't expect anything because we don't know what's going to happen. But out of it, I'm sure, will emerge with difficulty and great pain in, very, in some places good institutions, in some places nothing at all, uh, but, but never quickly. Well, I'm not sure we're disagreeing as, uh, as much as it may seem because, remember, I said as quickly as we can. I recognize that all the institutions, you know, will not uh, be able to develop overnight. The one place where I would disagree with you, however, would be whether you have people around who know how to work in a market system. I would agree that most of the people will not. I mean, they've been away from it for 50 years in, East, in Central Europe, in Russia, 70 odd years, and so most of the people haven't brought up in a market system. But I've been impressed how rapidly some people have adjusted to the market system. Um, let me take an example of the Czech Republic, but we, I think this equally well applies to Russia and equally well applies to Poland. We can discuss some of those as well. Let's consider the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic has a well-functioning, in some respects, market, market system. All the people there had, had difficulty making the adjustment. No doubt about that. They lived too long under communism. But the younger people, fortunately, weren't as spoiled by the communist system. And it's interesting to find that many of the people becoming the leaders in business, the leaders even in government, are very young people. You know, when Klaus was on the campus and you were at our house there, he had two advisors with him. One of them was 28, one of them was in his early 30s. I mean, these were the principal advisors to the prime minister. It's young people who are establishing a major role in these economies, I think for the reasons you're citing that other people have become too acclimated, too habituated to operating under a collectivistic system and young people have not been, so to speak, their minds have not been so spoiled by that. So I think you do find the talent, you do find the ability in the system to make the transition. Is it going to happen overnight? No, I agree with you. Not everything is going to happen overnight. All I would claim is you try to move as quickly as you can to give people the opportunity, those who do have the talents, 
for working in a market system to use these talents. And I think if you compare the rates of growth, unemployment, inflation across different parts of Central and Eastern Europe, I think you do find those countries that have moved as quickly as they can in freeing prices, privatizing, are doing a lot better. Well, I think some countries can. I, you mentioned Czechoslovakia. I remember a meeting during the Dubček period with economists from Czechoslovakia. And of all the Eastern European countries, they were the most enthusiastic about moving to a market. So I think you, that uh, in Czechoslovakia you already had, under communism, a substantial group of people who favored the market and who understood a market. Uh, but I don't think that's true in, in, in many of the other countries. Uh, I, I don't know in detail what's going on, but uh, the reports I get about Russia seem to me to be very discouraging. Uh, and, f and I think for the reasons I've given, 70 years is a long time. The, many of these countries were not so much uh, converted to communism, but they were subjugated by, by the Russians. And the attitude of many, many people in these countries was very, very different. They hadn't been taught uh, the, how fine communism is. Or if they were taught, they thought of it as an alien doctrine. So the, the attitude is different. But I think, I think uh, Czechoslovakia is, is a country which is a little different. After all, it's, it's only, uh, it's only 40 years, and it take even to introduce communism can't be done quickly. You 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 start off by breaking up the system in in in, in a way. So so there are many people in Czechoslovakia who understand how a market works, and I suspect the institutions there were not broken down in the way they were, say, uh, in uh, um, in Russia or some of the other countries, such as Bulgaria, I gather. Well, well, let's take... Or oh, Romania. Yeah. Let's take... Well, I think the problem with Bulgaria and Romania was that the people who got into power, particularly in Romania, but to some extent also in Bulgaria, were the ex were former communists. And they didn't want to move rapidly. And they've done very little. Well, if you do very little, you're not going to move toward a market economy. Poland is a good intermediate example, but also I'd like to address the Russian case. Poland in, was subjugated involuntarily about the same time as... Czechoslovakia and so on. Poland was not quite as much communistic or as Czechoslovakia because it still had mainly a private agricultural sector while Czechoslovakia was almost 100%. And they kept other. private farming. Too. Yeah, that's right, private farming. That's yeah. what I do. But if you look in their industrial, non-farming sector, Poland has showed great entrepreneurship. They've been slow, as I mentioned earlier, on privatizing, which I think has been a big mistake. But the growth of small private enterprises has been extremely rapid in Poland. So the people estimate now, despite the very slow privatization, possibly 70% of the Polish economy is already in private hands. Not through privatizing, but through a new company starting, very small companies making all kinds of things, including exports and so on. Russia is a harder case, I agree. 70 years of communism, it's so to speak, quote, voluntarily accepted communism rather mm -hmm. than being imposed by the Russians. It was more native, native uh, grown. Nevertheless, I'm also optimistic about Russia. I don't share the general pessimism uh, about the Russian economies. They had a, a, a great deal of difficulty in obtaining macroeconomic stability, which they haven't attained as yet. A lot of inflation, the ruble has been declining enormously over time and so on. But one thing the Russians have done, which I think argues well for their future, is in two years they have privatized over 14,000 medium and large scale enterprises, largely using a voucher system following the checks in that, wisely so I think. 85% now, according to the statistics that are coming out, 85% of the industrial employment in the Russian uh, Republic is in private hands. 
Now, it's not working perfectly. There's private hands. There's a lot of talk of mafiaism and this and that and um, monopoly, pockets of monopoly. It, it's going, it's held to skelter as you're making this enormous transition. I, I never would claim it's going to be smooth. All I would argue is they're much better off by having privatized so quickly than if they try to figure out what was the worth of all these companies and took 10 years the way the Bulgarians or the Romanians or, or uh, some, some of the Hungarians even have gone slowly in some respects and they were far along. They're much better off that they move quickly in this way because what looks to be health to skelter is often just another way of saying this is the way the market operates. It's disorganized, it's not centrally planned, but you give people the opportunity who, uh, who can show abilities and it's unpredictable. We know the markets are difficult to predict, but I think it's working there in Russia and I think we're underestimating the strength of the Russian economy, not now, but the potential strength due to the rapidity rapidity of the movement of privatization. Well, I'd be pleased if you were right, and I'm not, <laughs> I won't be unhappy to be, be wrong, but it, it does, again, the account, one does get accounts of what's going on in Russia, which are very pessimistic, and you no. mentioned, for example, the importance of the mafia. Well, all accounts one reads mentions the mafia mentions that the only people who knew how to work a market economy were the, were the criminals and uh, that this is having a very bad bad effect you, you have in fact uh, uh, a, a state in which the gangsters are running a large part of the economy this may be wrong but it certainly is a common account I know, but uh, i don't agree uh, with that what's account. going on there. there's a very interesting book written by diego gambetta on the mafia in southern italy and what, what, what gambetta tries to argue was the reason the mafia came about was in order because there weren't the institutions that you rightly were stressing before develop for enforcing contracts and so on. And while he doesn't try to claim that everything they did was good and so on, he, he does say they had an important uh, positive role along with the bad aspects of things, that they enforced contract, they got things rolling. I think to some extent that's what the Russian Mafia is doing. I think these accounts exaggerate the negative component of the Mafia. They, haven't, they don't have these institutions. That will take a while to develop. I agree with you. So other institutions come along, other ways of enforcing contracts. And I, I think in part what the mafia is doing is smoothing business transactions along with extortion and the negative side. I mean, it's obviously not the first best solution. We'd be better off having all these market institutions. There's no mafia. But I think the outsiders looking at the mafia through the eyes of the United States or contemporary Italy and seeing only bad, I think I'm making a mistake in judging the Mafia. I don't know. I mean, I'm no expert on the Russian Mafia. I don't claim to know. But it's just my guess that there's more of a positive role to it than um, is getting credit for. Oh, I wouldn't, wouldn't deny that there may be a positive role. But it's a very bad way to, to organize yeah. a market si system. And what puzzles me is what's happening to the law there. It's very difficult to, to introduce the, uh, a law which is appropriate for making contracts. We discovered that here, we discovered it in England. It took a long time with many amendments to the law to, to get it right. Well, they don't, don't really have a law there. They have a law which is completely inappropriate for a market economy. And while I don't know what the effect is, it must be very difficult, say, for an American firm or a British firm or a French firm to make contracts when you don't know what the rights are that you're acquiring. And this must hamper things very much. I'm sure it hampers it, but I, I don't think we should compare what's going on with, you know, with what, what we have in the United States or Britain. They're not anywhere near there. Even the Czech Republic is not there, although they may be the closest because they did have the, these traditions. But we, uh, I, I think the issue would be, will it take them 50 years to attain a, a, a well-functioning market or will it take them let's say another 10 years or whatever to do so. What are, the, what are the windows of time that we're thinking about? My own belief is that those nations that have moved as quickly as is possible by at least freeing up prices and wages, privatizing, allowing private uh, companies to come in, 
even though if they don't have all the rules uh, of contract well laid out and they don't have all the law laid out, will in a decade have achieved very close to a market type economy and certainly will achieve um, good economic performance. And it's already happening. Poland for the last three years has been growing about five, six percent per annum. Its unemployment is coming down. Businesses are springing up all the time. Exports are growing. So same thing, of course, is true in the Czech Republic. Um, Russia's going to be longer. I don't deny that. I hear accounts of the output has fallen in, 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 in Russia. No question. It has. Most of these nations, the first two or three years, it falls, and falls a lot. Although it's a little tricky, and we know it's how difficult it is to measure output, and how do you measure communist output when they're producing low-quality items, they get grossly o overvalued, and they're trading them. So I said, output surely has fallen, but I'm confident, without knowing the facts, it's fallen by a lot less than they claim, because it wasn't as high <laughs> as they claimed. That I, I agree, but it, it affects the attitude of the population oh, and, and makes it possible for these communists and so on to acquire power again. I've been impressed, I don't know whether I should be, by the difference between what's happened in, in Russia and what's happened in China. Now, the diff difference in China is that, on the whole, the change to the market has been pushed from below which is much better than, than, than the planning from above. The introduction, in, in particularly in agriculture, resulted in an enormous increase in output. So people's standards uh, of living increase, which makes it very difficult to reimpose a communist system because people are going to be worse off because they've just got better off, they don't want to go back to it. The, the, the advantage which uh, Mao had in the beginning was that he was able to promise the people conditions that were better. Well, they, they, they thought he was right, many of them, but uh, it, pro it proved not to be true. And I could like a system in which the change is in fact from not from not organized from the top which I I don't have much faith in anyway but which also is moving relatively slowly but positively and I think that's going to continue there so I uh, my doubts about Eastern Europe are somewhat enhanced by by seeing what ha what's happened in, in China well, I look at China differently. I mean, I agree it's come from below, but I think the changes were very rapid in China, particularly in the one sector of agriculture that you mentioned. China was 80% agriculture, maybe even more, at the time they began to liberalize. Unlike all these other nations that we say, which are much smaller, Poland was 20% agriculture. Also, the farmers were the mo most disadvantaged of everybody in China. They really uh, got it in the neck by the previous government. They were maybe one-fourth the income. So it was a wonderful place to start the reform. What they did was very simply. They basically, with various limits and so on, uh, went to a household responsible system whereby people could keep a considerable fraction of their output. And lo and behold, these people all very quickly discovered how to be entrepreneurs, so to speak, how to look out for their own interests. It didn't take them a long time. And so Chinese agriculture, I agree with you, came up very rapidly. Um, it was a good place to start, and it was very successful, but it did not take a long time. What's been slow in China, or relatively slow, is the movement in the rest of the sector, in the industrial sector, where output progress has been not as good, where things have been much slower, where they have had these big state enterprises, they still have, and they're responsible for a good part of their deficits that they're running at the national level. And the inflation that they're experiencing is financing these, these elephants. I they're... had thought this was also true of Eastern Europe, the state enterprises which have to be financed, although they're losing money, but which you find difficulty in closing down for political reasons. When you hold on to them, when you hold on to them, that's why I say get rid of them as quickly as you can. Poland has held on to them, they're a problem. The Czech Republic has much less held on to them. Even the Russians have not held on to as many of them. They still have a number of them, but they've gotten rid of, as I said, 85% of their industrial employment is now in the private sector. It's almost 100% in the Czech Republic, it's probably 90 to 93. In Poland, it's a, probably a somewhat smaller fraction, but still a growing fraction. 
Yes, if you hold on to them, they're terrible. That's, that makes my case, I think, why you want to get rid of them, even if things aren't arranged properly. Let the private sector deal with them, get rid of the employment, close them down when necessary. The longer you hold them, the more the political opposition grows. And that's why, as, as I, I said, come back to you know, my early points, that was one of the major points. It's partly, it's a political economy type of issue. It's not just straight, straight economics, as we agreed. It's, uh, if you do things quickly, you prevent the reversing of the policies. And I think that was explicitly part of the policies I know in the Czech Republic from uh, the yes, leaders. Uh, I don't particularly disagree with you on Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. but uh, again, not having gone there myself, from accounts I've received, I am pessimistic and I can see uh, about the rest of the uh, of Eastern Europe and I can see why. I just see how in order to, to have exchange, you have to have contractual arrangements. Yeah. You have to have trust. You have to have relationships built over a long time. You can't do that immediately. Absolutely. It must be very difficult to make a contract with, with, a, with a, a Russian c concern. Yeah. Uh, See, but I don't know if we're disagreeing on whether one should try to move quickly. All I'm saying is open up things as quickly as possible. That doesn't mean we're going to arrive at a well-functioning market economy quickly. I, I, this column of mine that you cited, I never asserted that. All I was just claiming was that those countries that opened up more quickly without worrying if everything was in place were doing better. I agree it's going to take time to develop all these things, although I don't think it's going to take as long as you're citing. I think there's a little bit of a disagreement there as well. I think it'll come quicker than you say because it's true, a good fraction of people aren't prepared, but a, good, a, 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 a small fraction will be. It'll be young. These are going to be young-driven economies, more than even our economy is, because they'll be more easy, able to shake off the um, or controls of the past. Contract system will not be perfect. But look, you can run a market economy uh, with imperfect uh, contracts, imperfect enforceability. It won't be as good a market economy as otherwise. It'll be, it'll be a lot better economy, in fact. Well, it'll be a lot better than what they had. I well, mean, they had a terrible economy. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So that's all we're saying. You know, how to do, do as well as you can rather than how to do, you know, how to get nirvana. They're not going to have nirvana. But it's going to be a lot better than what they had, and it's going to be a lot better than those parts, than those nations that say, well, we, we don't know. Let's wait until we get all the contract system into place. And let's wait until we write a new set of laws. And let's wait until we write a constitution. That's the view I'm arguing against. I don't know where you stand It's not that. really my, yeah, my yeah, view, yeah. because I don't believe much mm. in this planning from above. Yeah. And I think you should build on local institutions. I would like to see uh, the much more decentralization in these, these because if you have a decentralized system people will take account of their local circumstances they know what can be done they're not controlled also from above and prevented from doing things and uh, I uh, again I think that's what's happened in, in China they the, the, it's not the central government that's, that's really doing things it's, it's local governments and even local communities there that are, that are moving. Well, there we agree 100%, and maybe that's a good, a good uh, point in which we will move on to the next subject on a point of agreement, because we agree that the more local it is, the more it comes from below, the better it's going to be, because uh, people don't know enough to plan from, from above. I, I mean, I think that's the basic economics that uh, I, we're 100% in agreement on. Well, it's clear we have some agreements and some disagreements on the, the transition there. We both agree it should come from below rather than from above because central governments don't know enough, nor do they have the right incentives to plan uh, this process, so it's better to have it more spontaneous, so to speak. I think we maybe disagree some on the rapidity with which uh, changes can occur, the movement toward a market economy can occur. I think you believe it's going to be uh, considerably longer than I believe, although neither of us believe it's going to be easy. Uh, I believe it's going to be easier if uh, the central government takes its hands off of as much activity as possible and allow prices uh, to uh, uh, develop. I think you would agree with that. 
Yes, I, uh, it seems to me if you get the right institutions, you don't have to worry about prices. Right. People who exchange prices emerge. Regulation of prices seems to me a mistake. I agree. We agree on that. And the question then would be how optimistic or pessimistic we are about what the, the rapidity of the move and possibly to some extent uh, the direction we think the move should take. So there's a mixture of agreement and disagreement, which I think we could spend hours more talking about that, but I think we brought out some of the important differences and, and agreements between us.